Hey guys, Pastor Tim here. Hope you're ready for another video from our youth group at Lighthouse Baptist Church. If this is your first time watching a video or you're trying to catch up on a missed lesson, we hope that this video is a blessing to you and helps you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. As we continue on, we're going to talk about give and it shall be given. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says this, and I need to turn a page, long chapter says, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, withal it shall be measured to you again. So it's talking about when you give, it shall be given unto you. So the, the idea is that if we follow this principle of giving, and when I'm talking about giving, it's not just uh, of you know tithe and so forth like that, of your money, but giving of your time, your resources, whatever it is. If you have a giving spirit or characterized by a giving spirit is what we're talking about, uh, you will have, uh, God will give back unto you. Again, not in monetary things only or else like that, but you will be blessed for your giving in return. So ask yourself this question, just think for a moment. Do you consider yourself a giver or a taker? Obviously, we're here in church and stuff. You know, you might instinct instinctually automatically think, well, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a giver, and so forth. But if you truly step back and you evaluate your life, do you think you could really be characterized as a giving person or a taking person? Okay. Now, we live in a taker world, okay, a, a, a taking world. Can anybody think of anything that we see in life and society, whatever, that kind of shows that we live in a taker world? Ethan? Christmas, Christmas presents. Can, enc can encompass both, but how can Christmas presents uh, characterize a taking type of mentality? We're all about giving the gifts. I mean, some people are about giving it, but a lot of people are looking forward to it. Hopefully, yeah. Giving Usually we just liken it unto uh, little kids because little kids are very bad. They, they, they can't discern these things quite yet. So they're all about like, hey, I want this for Christmas, and I want that. Are you going to get me this? And, and they, they start telling you in like July what they want. All right, it's just like Miss Christine already asked me in September what I'm going to do for the teen Christmas party. But anyway, <laughs> it is true. <laughs> oh, I love you, baby. Anyway, so uh, can anybody think of any other way that we see that we live in a taking world? Uh, Greg. Uh, in politics, it's all about the, the politicians and why we should support them and why they deserve our votes and why they should be on top because they're trying to take. Yeah, yeah, in some ways, especially in how they talk around issues and so forth, or they might just say what you want to hear in order to get your, your, your allegiance and so forth, so to speak. Uh, any ladies? Hmm? Mercy? Oh, okay, you just scratched your nose. That's all right. Um, one thing that we're, a couple things we see all the time is not just so much that of people taking from us, but even how people themselves could have a taking attitude is uh, there's a plethora of get rich schemes okay and the only reason those things are prevalent and still exist are because people they give into them or, or they buy into them because they're trying to look for any way they can get something for nothing they don't want to give up themselves you know so to speak to gain money or something like that but they'll definitely buy into something that says oh yeah you don't have to do anything to get all this stuff and usually they're scams and so forth you know in the future guys when you have your own phones if you don't have them already you're going to get scam calls and so forth. And the reason people fall for them is because a lot of times people are like, hey, I'll take, I'll try to do whatever route I can take to get something for nothing. All right. And I didn't write down the statistics, but millions of dollars are spent every year on people that buy into the things like weight loss pills and get rich quick schemes and other things like that so that they don't have to put in any effort in order to get a result. All right, but anything worth doing, guys, anything worth accomplishing is going to take work. Okay, so you can't simply have a taker's mentality. See, God's way is different. He wants us to give, and he promises that he will bless us in return. Now, this does not mean that we should not save money. In fact, that's a wise thing to do. That's being a good steward of your money. But you definitely shouldn't hoard. All right, never wanting to deal out anything, never wanting to give of yourself in any way. But in addition to saving, God wants us to see the importance of giving as well. So we're going to look at this evening a couple of reasons that one becomes a giver, or at least a Christ-like giver. Okay, And the first one we're going to talk about is givers understand the character of God. The reason you want to have a 
character of giving is because you understand that's how God is as well. Someone help me out. In what way do we see that God or Christ is a giver? Now we got to lay. Joanna. He gave, his only son. he gave his only son. That's the biggest one. Can anyone think of anything else, ladies? And that shows that God is a, a giving person. Yes? All right, that's true. Uh, Luke. Gave us a will. Gave us, yeah, gave us free will. And, and a lot of things. He, and we're going to talk about he, he meets our, our physical, our spiritual needs, all these things. Um, I want you to look at two verses I'm going to show up here really quick that just kind of should, when you think about it, should one put you in awe of, you know, who God is, but also just kind of rock you to court that someone so great is also a giving person who gives unto us who really in the eyes of God, in the grand scheme of things, we're, we're nothing. God doesn't need us, all right? Yet, as we already said, he gave of himself, he gave his son. Um, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. All right? Plain and simple, what is this saying about God? Yeah, everything's God's. He created everything. The only reason we're here is because of God. The only reason we can do any of the things that we do are, is because of God. But look at what else we see. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to, the glory, to glory and virtue. So the one who created all things, who for the only reason we even exist is because he willed it so, and created us in the womb and so forth, the great creator of all who owes us nothing, it still gives unto us, all right? And he gives unto us all things that pertain unto life, that we need to live life, and godliness, what we need to grow in our relationship with Christ, to grow as a Christian, and to glorify him, okay? That's the character of God. So understanding that, Okay, we want to exemplify the same character of God in our lives. Jesus Christ, when he lived here on earth, exemplified in many ways how we should live our lives even today. In Christ, and you can go through the Gospels, you can see how Jesus Christ himself was a very giving person. The Son of God came, yes, we know ultimately to give himself on the cross and to die for our sins. That's the ultimate sign of his giving. But the miracles he performed, the people that he touched, the, the poor and needy that he reached, he was even scoffed for eating with the publicans and sinners, the lowest of the low, yet he understood that's who he's come to save, and that's who he's come to serve. Uh, so let's look at a couple of things that Christ, the character of God, that some of his characteristics, or what he does for us, and how it pertains to us to give today. So number one, he gives salvation. We understand that. Okay, His generosity towards us knows no bounds, even that of his own life. Okay, He gave himself for us. So think about this. If God has given his own life for us, he will not refuse us anything less than his best. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes people get into a funk or they get into a, you know, maybe because circumstances are less than ideal. And they start, as we talked about last week, they start to question the care of God. And in questioning the care of God, they, they think like, you know, God's not giving them what they deserve. They may not think it, that, they may not say it that way. But what they're really saying is God did not give them what they deserve. In essence, saying it's God's withholding from them. All right? But we need to understand that the one who gave his life for our sins, who before we were even born, who were condemned already, commended his love towards us, even that while we were yet in sins, Christ died for us, that same one okay, is not going to refuse us his best. Now, that's the important thing to understand, though. It's his best. You may think, oh, I think this is what's best for me. But just because you think it's best for you does not mean it's actually what's best for you. You guys understand that? When you were a kid, okay, and you thought the only thing you ever needed to eat was, you know, Milky Ways or Snickers bar or just candy, okay, you thought that's what's best for you. But who in your life told you that's not what's best for you? Your parents, hopefully. Maybe not your dad, but hopefully your mom. <laughs> All right. That's not good for you. Okay? And that's for a reason. So understand, there may be something you think you, that you need, desperately need, that your life won't be fulfilled without this. 
but God knows what's best for you, and he's not going to withhold his best for you. All right, and we see that evident in the fact that he even gave himself in salvation. Secondly, he gives security. Okay, and I'm going to show you two things real quick, and I'll just put them up now so that you guys can write them down if you want. So a couple of things that show he gives us security is that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. When you accept Christ as your Savior, the Bible talks about how you are sealed all right, in earnest by the Spirit of God. It's kind of like the, the, the token on your behalf, of God's behalf, that shows that you will, not will, that you are his child and that you will be um, preserved until the day of redemption. Therefore, nothing can separate you from God. You guys understand that? Um, and this is one of the things we go to all the time when someone's struggling with assurance of salvation. All right, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 38 to 39 is a very uh, familiar verse to many of you. It talks about, you know, neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come. You, 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 how many guys are familiar with that? All right. And that's just talking about there's nothing in this world that's going to take the seal of the Holy Spirit off of your life. Nothing's going to separate you from God. You have security. God gives security. But another thing that gives us security is his unchanging nature. Okay? Does anybody know the fancy uh, theological term for God's unchanging nature? If you've done discipleship with me, you might know it. Nope. Yes. Immutability. Immutability. That is correct. His immutability. You don't have to know that, but if you want to write that down, go ahead. Uh, But it's talking about he's unchanging. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, and the reason his unchanging nature also gives us security is, as I have there, yes, it proves his dependability, okay, but, mm, I won't ask you, but his unchanging nature gives us security because it shows, one, he's, he's dependable, and he never fails us. One is his promises never fail. Okay, so you can understand when you read in the Bible, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that that's something you can depend on. Okay, how many guys understand that with man can, man, man can, mankind, you can't always depend on what man says. Why is that? Why can you not always depend on what man says, Ethan? Their opinion and ideology are fickle. They're fickle. It changes from time to time. You guys even understand with your siblings, okay? If your sibling says, all right, you, you look at him and say, hey, Nevaeh, don't tell mom. Don't tell her. And she's like, yeah. And then next thing, when mom comes home, you guess what she did? And she just tattles on you and stuff. You can't always depend on man's word. All right? I'm not saying Neve is a narc or anything like that. But don't trust her with anything. But man's opinions, their word can be fickle at times. God, though, he's unchanging. He's immutable. Therefore, he's dependable, and he never fails us. I have in your notes there James 1.17. Uh, for sake of time, we won't go there. But James 1.17 talks about every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. All right, referring to God, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Okay, talking about he's not going to just turn on his opinions or something like that right away. No variableness. It doesn't vary. You know, God's attitude towards man, his love towards you does not vary from time to time. Does not vary when you are not performing up to up to stuff and you're kind of falling behind other people. No, it, he's unchanging. He gives us salvation. He gives security. Thirdly, he gives sustenance. Okay. And uh, a couple things to write down here if you want. He provides our physical needs. He provides our spiritual needs. And he provides during trials. Okay. So he provides our physical needs. He provides our spiritual needs. And he provides in trials. Yes, Sustenance is like, um, I don't know, I'm going to say it's a fancy word. It's just another way of saying provision. So a lot of times when people use it, they're referring to like food or shelter or something like that, material goods. Uh, But it's just provisions. It's another way you can say it. So, yes, how does God meet our physical needs? What are the sustenance or the provisions man needs just physically? Micah? Water and food. What else does man need just physically other than water? Yes, you need more than water and food, guys. Yeah. You need rest. That is true. And God is rest. Yes. Shelter. shelter. Preferably shelter. Yes. You know, some people want to, you know, you know, man up and go out there in the gray outdoors and sleep on a rock like Brother Patrick when we used to do the ammo with show and so forth. But understand, there's a reason man made a mattress. OK, <laughs> and that's because we got soft and we're no, no, I'm just kidding. We're no longer want to sleep on rocks. But yes, shelter, food, clothing. All those things are what we need physically. 
All right, he meets our, oh, I have a verse right up here. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. He meets our spiritual needs through his word, all right? It guides us, it reveals his promises, and nourishes our souls, okay? That's why we, it's important to be in the word, okay? The word is likened unto bread, and, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh out of God. We need to eat as well. I, I recently went over this with Josh in our latest discipleship uh, lesson. All right. How often do you guys need to eat? Daily. 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 All right. Sometimes five times a day. You know, <laughs> you're a hobbit or something. But uh, you need to eat daily. You need to eat several times a day. Okay. Do you think you would be healthy, strong, vibrant if you only ate twice a week? And I'm talking like just two, maybe three meals if you're really good at it, okay? No, you wouldn't. I don't know, maybe, I, I have done the, the research on this. I'm thinking, yeah, you probably would be able to live for a while like that, but would it be much of a living? No, okay? But that's oftentimes how a lot of Christians treat their relationship with God's Word. It's what we need to feed on every day, but they only feed on it twice a week. And if we were to see your... You know, if you had like a, a spiritual form that we could see, it could be a, it, it would be a frail, weak, bar barely vibrant spiritual being that's only feeding twice a week. You guys follow that? All right. You need to eat on that. All right. And in trials, God gives us grace to sustain us and strength to overcome those difficulties. Psalm 55, 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And our last blank I have there in your notes is that he gives satisfaction, okay? Meaning he, you know, he, only in our relationship with Christ are we able to be content. And only in our relationship with Christ can we find true rest. When we seek contentment in God, we find pleasure that never ends. Someone help me out. The pleasure of this world are but for a season, season all right? And I know in Texas we only have two, but there's more. All right. Second main point, givers obey the command of God. It's a command to give. Okay, we see that in our text, give, not if you think about it, if you want to, if you feel like it. No, it says give, and it shall be given unto you. Okay, now we're going to cover two factors that compel us to give as God commands. All right, and right off the bat, it's our love for God and our outlook on life. But first we're going to talk about, and this is a long Heading here, obedience to God's commands in general, not just the command to give, but obedience to God's commands is contingent on my love. In essence, my love for God. John 14, 15 says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. All right, very easy verse to remember. Uh, it's very short there. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Giving comes naturally when we do it out of love for God. Okay. It's harder to think of what to give someone that you barely know or that you barely do anything with, all right? But, okay, that's a bad way to put it because sometimes we do struggle to give gifts to someone we really do love and so forth. How many guys ever struggle giving gifts to, like, your mom or something like, I don't know, it's so hard. But, let me, let me, so let me rephrase that. You're much more willing to give, though, to someone you love. All right, as opposed to someone you don't really care for. Like, you know, why would I want to spend, all right, maybe five bucks. Oh, that, that costs six dollars? Nah, you know, <laughs> something like that. We're well, more apt to give when you love that person, okay? Uh, so loving God, we, we should be more apt to keep his commandments, including the command to give. So let's think about this real quick. Got a couple things here. Loving God changes who I am, okay? It changes me from a self-pleaser to a God-pleaser. It changes me from a self-seeker to a God-seeker. Right? I'm not just simply thinking about what I want, what I need, what I desire. No, I'm thinking about how can I please God? How can I serve God? How can I do whatever it is to glorify God in my life? Mark 12, 30 says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. Um, so it changes who you are. So if, you love your, if you're not loving God, it doesn't change who you are. You're simply you're gonna, you're, you're not going to have that giving mentality like God does. You're going to have that taking mentality. You're not going to be a God seeker or a God pleaser. You're going to be a self seeker, a self pleaser. But loving God not only changes who I am, loving God changes what I do. 
All right, this all builds upon one another. If, all right, loving God changes who I am. I'm not no longer trying to seek myself. All right, I'm seeking to do what's right. So that means, hey, I'm going to try to give more. So it's changing what I'm doing. You guys follow that? Um, and then lastly, loving God changes why I do. Okay, why am I doing these things? Why am I giving more? Why am I trying to become a, a more of a giver? Well, it's because I love God and I want to please him. Your why changes, your motivation changes. So flip this, all right, think for a second. Change God out for your, your parents, okay? Loving my parents changes who I am. So meaning I'm not simply seeking to do what I want. I'm seeking to, all right, what do my, you know, obey my parents to, to fulfill uh, what they expect of me when it comes to what I need to do in the house and so forth. Loving my parents changes what I do. So instead of, you know, going and doing like video games or whatever it may be, I'm going to get done what my parents asked me to do first. And then loving my parents changes why I do that. I'm not just doing it because oh, they made me do it or oh, just because, it, you know, it's my job or whatever. No, I'm, I'm doing it because I love my parents. All right. And I want to obey them. OK, simple illustration, but just to kind of put it in a, a different picture for us. OK, so obedience to God's command to give is contingent on my love. And then obedience to God's command, God's commands is contingent on my look or if you want to put down my outlook. A heavenly outlook will help us see the command to give as an invitation to store up treasures in heaven, not to just simply give away of what we have. All right. Everyone turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. All right. Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to uh, read verse 1 through 4. All right. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Give everybody a second. All right, if you're not there yet, you're too slow. All right, verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are below. Is that correct? No. no. Wow, oh, so only some of you are there. All right, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are below. Is that correct? No. All right, a little better. All right, <laughs> seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So set your affections on things above. Another way to say, set your affection on things that matter, things of eternal weight, not just simply the kind of car I want, the kind of person I want to be in a relationship with, the kind of things I want to own. No, there's greater things. There are more important things in life to be worried about, especially when it comes to God. So having the correct outlook is going to definitely change how you obey the commands of God, not just the commands to give, but the commands of loving thy neighbor, of worshiping God, the 10 commandments. If you want to go that way, it changes your, your outlook changes how you obey God's commands. Okay. You guys follow that, All right? If you're seeking to please God, if you're loving God as you should, if you're try, seek, uh, putting your, outlook your affection on things above it's definitely going to encourage you motivate you to keep god's commands more all right our last main point for this evening is givers trust and givers trust the care of god i guess i have that wrong in your notes there i'm sorry givers trust the care of god all right let me just get your points out here real quick the world finds security in their finances all right if you have more money if you have more this if you have more that you're fine but God wants us to find security in him. So when we give, this is what it shows God. It shows we prioritize God over our needs and take his word by faith that he will care for us. Okay. The reason people withhold, the, we, the reason people hoard, all right, it's not necessarily that they think God won't care for them if they give of themselves, but it's a selfish motivation. All right. But even giving... All right, when it might be hard, when times are lean, giving unto the ministry, giving unto God, whatever the case may be, or giving unto someone in need, all right, it shows your faith in God that God will provide your needs. Okay? Um, Matthew chapter 6, okay, God's talking to his disciples, 
And he's telling them, now we know Matthew 6, verse 33, you know, but seek ye things, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You guys know that? All right. So we know verse 33, but the rest of the verses leading up to that is pretty much Christ telling his disciples, hey, this is what you guys need to understand. Don't worry about when you're following me. It's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be, um, you know, sunshine and roses. Okay. There's going to be rough times. You're not always going to have a place to pillow your head. You're not always going to know where your next meal is going to come from. But he uses a couple of illustrations to show that, hey, I'm going to take care of you. And he talks about, sorry, the lilies. Okay. The lilies of the field. All right. How they're adorned and they're beautiful and they look great, but they don't they don't do anything. It's not like they go out and purchase their, their color and raiment or anything like that. But he's saying, but God, you know, God loves the lily so much that he adorns them in better raiment than even Solomon had. And he talked about like a sparrow. You know, if God knows every sparrow that falls or keeps the sparrow in flight and so forth and provides for the animal's needs and so forth, how much more will God provide for his children's needs? You guys follow that? God's going to take care of you. In, in fact, go back to our verse, our text verse here. All right, Luke chapter 6, all right, in verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. All right, God's using a, a, a picture illustration here if you guys didn't realize it. All right, verse 38, give. So he's commanding, hey, you guys need to give. And it shall be given unto you. So number one, understand that God's blessing, the return on your giving is a certainty. All right. If you're giving of yourself to others, if you're giving of yourself to the ministry, God's not going to maybe give back unto you. No, you will have return on that. All right. Once again, not monetarily, so to speak, all the time or in that way, but God blesses a cheerful giver. So and it shall be given unto you. But notice how God does give. It says good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, on a cursory glance, because we don't have the context, you might be like, what does that even mean? All right, good measure, pressed down. He's given an illustration of someone going to the market and buying grain, okay? And they have a sack that they're trying to fill grain. And so let's look what he says here. Given shall be given unto you good measure. So you're going to get a good amount back in, back in your vessel there. He's talking about you're getting a good amount in the sack of the grain and so forth. But not only do you get a good amount, notice what he says, press down. How many of you guys, this isn't a perfect one-to-one -one illustration, but because you're lazy and you know you're supposed to take out the trash, but you don't want to take out the trash, what is the first thing you do? Press it down. You press it down. Why? Because you can do what? Save more space. Not save more space. You can put more in it, right? <laughs> and it's giving that kind of illustration saying, hey, if you give, God's going to give back to you so much so that it's like you were to fill up your bag with the grain you need, but not just simply fill it up. He's going to press it down so he can make sure that there's more in it. And notice what he says. He says, good measure, press down and shake. He's, hey, make sure that there's no loose air or anything like that. Like every square cubic inch of that bag is going to be filled with grain. So it's shaken, it's filled up, it's pressed down. But not only is it filled up, what happens after shaken together? What does it say there? and running over, all right? God gives exceedingly and abundantly above anything we ask or think. Guys, whatever you're, you're seeking to withhold unto yourself, all right, that you're not giving of yourself unto the Lord because you think you need this or that, God can give back to you in return much more than you think that thing you're holding on to is going to give you. Whether that be a relationship, whether that be a job, whether that be a object or some material thing that you think is giving you pleasure. Remember, the pleasures of, of this world are but for a season. They're not going to last. Material things, they come out with the newest thing every year. All right? Um, but what, can, what God can give you is so much better than what you're trying to hold unto yourself. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give it to your bosom. That's the last picture. It's not, uh, so sometimes when people went to the market, maybe they didn't have a sack or anything, so they'll actually use their... Uh, cloak or whatever gown they're wearing or something they'll kind of lift it up so that they can uh, put it in like that like almost like their own made basket so guess what they're ended up holding it close to their their chest okay okay but a lot of times when you hear the the term be, something being held to the bosom it's a kind of an affectionate near type of idea all right someone being held to the bosom all right someone being held close to someone's heart and so forth 
Not only will God give abu- uh, 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 abundantly and exceedingly above what you ask or think, all right, now is God going to give back unto you more than what you think you're holding on to is going to give to you, but it's going to be something you're going to cherish much more dearly. And it's going to be something that matters much more in the long term, something that will be not just dear to your heart, but to the heart of God as well. All right, Jesus made it clear in Acts 20, 35, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So the question is, how are you doing on giving? Okay, not just money, but in character. Are you a giving person? Are you willing to go out and help someone in need? Are you willing to go out and pray for someone in need? Are you even thinking about, hey, what are my fellow classmates going through right now? What is something I can help them with? All right, this lifetime that you have is the only opportunity you have to invest in eternity. Don't waste it on simply just investing in yourself. 